So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Samantha Burke. I'm the Higher Ed Program Manager for IMS Global, and I'd like to welcome you um, and thank you for taking some time out of your um, Friday afternoon uh, to join us for this afternoon's presentation, Getting to Inclusive Education, How IMS Standards Impact Accessibility. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started. I know there are some folks that are still um, coming in online. Um, and we will do our best to get them caught up. Um, I also would like to um, remind everyone that your audio is automatically muted um, coming into the meeting. If you have any questions or um, issues or would like to make a comment, um, please feel free to do so using either the chat or the Q&A tool um, within WebEx. Um, myself and my colleague, Kara Jenkins, is our Director of Communications. At IMS Global, we'll be monitoring both of those as we go through this afternoon's session. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So, um, so Kara, can you, um, I'm going to go ahead and release a polling um, device. Um, it should be up um, down in the corner um, while we do some formalities here. Um, if everyone could just sort of weigh in for, um, does your institution have a campus-wide strategic plan um, for accessibility. Um, and go ahead and yes, no, I don't know, or non-applicable. Um, and while you are um, sharing that information with us, I'd like to go through the agenda um, a little bit. Um, so we are going to do some welcomes, and I will be introducing our panelists of experts here in just a minute. Um, and I will be turning it over to do the, um, for the presentation. Um, we do have the time set aside for question and answer. Um, go through this. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I'm with IMS Global uh, Learning Consortium, and I'd like to introduce um, our panel of experts today. Um, first is Jess Thompson, who is the Accessibility Technologies at Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. So Jess, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon and lending your expertise. We also have Scott Reddy, um, Accessibility Solutions at Blackboard, and John Scott, who is the Community Manager for Blackboard Ally. And we are thrilled to be joined by these panel of experts. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to um, John, um, Scott, I believe it is, um, to take us through the next several slides. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Samantha. And welcome, everybody. To start off with, Let's talk a little bit about some barriers to equitable student choice. And in doing so, what I'd like to do is to first take a look at some very inclusive designs so that we can get our site set on how it should be, and then talk about some barriers. So when we take a look at how an inclusive design should be, I like to go back to our physical environment. On this image that's on the screen, there are actually three ways of moving from floor to floor. There is an escalator on the far left. In the center, there's an elevator. And on the far right, there's a staircase. You know, oftentimes we might look at that and think, well, isn't that a little bit of an overkill? I mean, why, why would you need three various ways of being able to move from floor to floor. Well, if we kind of break it down and take a look at the elevator for to begin with, obviously if an individual has a or uses a wheelchair, then the elevator would be the the only way to be able to move from floor to floor. But why not just have an elevator? Why bother having the escalator and also the stairs? Well, if we think about that, then that would create quite a long queue line and, and just being able to use an elevator. So we've added an escalator. Okay, well, that makes sense that you would have an escalator and an elevator, but is it really necessary to have the stairs? But how many of us would prefer to have stairs so that we can actually get a little cardio in and climb stairs and be able to have that little extra exercise as we move from floor to floor. Or in the uh, situation where maybe the electricity would go out, the stairs would still be a viable way of being able to move from floor to floor. When we look at this, 
oftentimes we see one way of being able to provide an equitable access. And that's true when we take a look at our digital learning too. But when we can take a look at ways that we're going to provide multiple ways of going from one floor to the other or from engaging with content in our courses, we're really meeting the needs not just for accessibility, but for student preferences. There's not one way here that is right or wrong. An escalator, an elevator, or a, uh, a flight of stairs. They're all equitable ways of gaining access from floor to floor. The same thing can be true in our digital environment. Oftentimes when we look at our digital environment, I again like to go back to our physical environment and make the comparison. On the image on the far left, we see a student that is sitting in a wheelchair outside of the building that requires stairs in order to enter the building. I'm pretty sure that we would all agree that it would be absolutely ridiculous for that student to have to sit there and wait for someone to come alongside and build a ramp in order for that student to be able to gain access to that building. But let me ask, isn't that really the way that we're dealing with our digital environment? Historically, the approach has been a very reactionary approach. It's been waiting until the student identifies the inability to engage with content, making that known to somebody or some office, waiting for that office to make a remediation of that document, and then a few days later, a few weeks later, being able to then engage with that content while all the rest of the students have already surpassed that point. So when we look at barriers, oftentimes it's unintentional barriers, but it's barriers within the process that we need to take a look at. And how can we get around those barriers? How can we tear those barriers down so they no longer are preventing us from engaging? When we look at a study that was done over five-year period, we see that, honestly, there has not been much progress. We see that over 700,000 courses were studied with 21 million content items over a five-year period. If we look at the overall accessibility score of those content items from five years ago to today, they've only gained a few percentage points. Five years ago, it started out at 27.5% accessible content to today being 30 percent accessible. That's a very slow increase in accessibility. So we're going to talk about ways of being able to drastically improve that so that we see a quicker return and improvement on accessibility. I have a quote here from Tina Haskin, who's a graduate student and instructor, and Tina says, the problem with only having one format to choose from, coming from someone who is blind and the technology that I use, is that not every technology can use one format. So oftentimes we look at ways of being able to engage with uh, content, and if we provide a Braille document or electronic Braille version, then we think that should be the one version that applies to everybody that would fit into a category of being blind, but that's not true. There's various ways that individuals engage with content depending on technology, depending on preferences, depending on types of disabilities. So when we look at this, we need choices. Now to broaden that even further, on college campuses here in the United States, there are 60 to 80% of students that have a disability on campus that are not disclosing their disability. 
And that's for various types of reasons. Some are not wanting to disclose because they prefer not to be identified. Others haven't been diagnosed, as well as various other reasons. But the point is, is that if we are only addressing accommodations with those students that have disclosed, then we're not meeting the needs of a larger percentage of students and providing a better educational experience for all students. We have talked to hundreds of institutions and have asked them to share with us what their experience has been with barriers to universal access. And at the institution level, they tell us that it's a lack of insight. They're not able to see areas where there are barriers in the digital environment. And there's also inefficient workflows. From the instructor's perspective, they've shared with us that there's really a lack of awareness and a lack of knowledge of how to create accessible content. And then the students, well, they have shared with us the long delays that they experience and the inflexible formats that they're forced to be to use that are not really meeting the needs of the way that they want to be able to engage with that content. So when we look at these barriers and these challenges from the institution to the instructor and to the student, those, ally, those barriers are able to be something that we can really work with when it comes to a seamless solution. And so Scott? Yes. Sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Do um, you mind going back one slide? Be glad to. So I have a question for Jeff um, Thompson, who joins us from um, <clears throat> the uh, Washington uh, Technical and Community Colleges. Um, so Jeff, when you look at your um, campuses and the work that you do um, at a, at a system-wide level, um, what do you find to be some of the larger challenges that institutions are, and instructors and students are facing with universal access? I think for, well, from the system perspective, I'd say one of my challenges is uh, we have 34 colleges that are all very different. Um, so we have some colleges where there's a really strong team in place in order to kind of start you know, advocating for accessibility and supporting accessible course design. And in other cases, we have colleges where, you know, maybe someone's able to do that in a part-time position. Um, so being able to support those colleges from our level is really difficult when they're at such different places. Um, and I'd say really one of the kind of calls for action that we received early on uh, as policies were coming out that were really, you know, pushing the colleges to start engaging in this work um, was building awareness and just making people aware of what they don't know. Um, and I think that that can be challenging with accessibility because sometimes people are, you know, know, know just enough to be dangerous. And what I mean by that is they know it's something they need to be aware of and work on, but they don't know what that entails. And it's intimidating. And so, therefore, they avoid it as much as they can right now um, or kind of put it on the back burner. And, and so finding a way to kind of build the momentum and get people moving on this while not completely overwhelming them <laughs> uh, has been, I think, a challenge um, because we want them to see kind of the scope of the problem, but we don't want to scare them away from the problem. Thank you, Jess, for that insight. Appreciate it. Um, Scott, you want to back to you? Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, Jess. I appreciate that. And so when we look at those challenges, many of you might have already heard of Ally. Ally is a seamless solution that really takes a look at the learning management system have it be Blackboard Learn, Canvas, Moodle Rooms, or Moodle, and really is able to have three 
components to Ally. The three components to Ally are alternative accessible versions that are created automatically when a content item is uploaded into the learning management system. Instructor feedback is provided around that content item that's been uploaded to provide information to the instructor about the accessibility and what the barriers are in that content item. For example, if the content item is a scanned PDF and it results in an image, then the instructor feedback will provide information to the instructor about that scanned PDF and why that scanned PDF is not accessible. And then the third component of Ally is the institutional report, which provides the institution insight into being able to see the accessibility of the content throughout the entire LMS. And my colleague John is going to be able to take us a little bit further into the workflows of, of these areas and further uh, describe how these align. So with that, John, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Scott. And hello, everybody. Let's see, do I have the controls? Great. Um, and so I'm going to be talking uh, first here about interoperability, access, and awareness. And what we find is that IMS standards have really played a key role in how we've developed our allies solution. And one of the key pieces to that is with LTI and being able to look inside of the LMS. Previously, we've, we've often thought about the LMS as a black box, but these types of standards have really been busting that box open. And from an accessibility perspective, this allows us to look inside of the LMS and really get a sense of all the different kinds of content that's been living in there. As you saw from the study that Scott referenced, there's a lot of different kinds of content that's living in there, and a lot of it is very inaccessible. And so by being able to look at all of that content, Ally is able to scan all of the content items, and we do that using an accessibility checklist that includes uh, WCAG 2.0 AA standards. And from there, we'll assign each of those items a score. And so that score is based on how many of those, you know, how many of those checklist items does the content item satisfy. Uh, and we use an algorithm that will, that will basically produce a, a percentage score of, that, that approximates the accessibility of that file. And with that information, we're able to use some machine learning algorithms to examine the structure and the semantics of the document uh, to produce a more accessible starting point. And so as soon as you turn Ally on in your LMS using the LTI integration, you're already going to see an immediate bump in the accessibility of the documents in your course environment. But that's not all we're going to do when we look at those documents. We're also going to produce those alternative formats that Scott talked about. And we know that having access to those alternative formats is hugely important for students with disabilities, but they're also hugely important for all those other students, either with non-disclosed disabilities or just general life practices. And so you can see how our integration with the learning management system is really key to how students are able to access these alternative formats. Right next to uh, the files in the LMS, and you're looking at a screenshot from Blackboard Learn and from Moodle Rooms, you can see that the dropdown now includes an alternative formats um, uh, bar there. And from there, we can click that, and Ally is going to prompt us um, with a modal here that has several different alternative formats to choose from. And so you can go from having that inaccessible scanned PDF to generating an auto-tagged PDF, generating an HTML version that's going to be really ideal for um, a responsive, responsive text that, that works great on mobile devices, an EPUB version that you can load up in your, in your ebook and, and get all of those great features for annotating and, and for highlighting, an electronic Braille version for, for students that use Braille displays, and an audio version. And so you can listen to that MP3 on the go. So really expanding the possibilities for how students can engage with content 
And what we've learned is that other universities and colleges that have implemented some other kinds of alternative formats, they've typically, typically existed outside of the student workflow and outside of the immediate experience of, of the learning management system. And that was a deterrent uh, for students, or, or at least it limited the kind of uptake that they could see with the use of those alternative formats. So having that seamless integration right where the file content lives is a huge, huge opportunity for students to, to get access to content in formats they otherwise may not have ever noticed. And we've so, seen stories. Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry, this is Sam. So I just wanted to, um, we had a question that came in that I think is you know, kind of relevant at, that, at this juncture. Um, so you mentioned the algorithms that you're using in the checklist is against the WCAG 2.0. Um, so one of the questions is, what does the roadmap look like in terms of updating and keeping that checklist current, um, particularly with the release of WCAG 2.1? Yeah, it, it, it's definitely something that, that our dev team really stays on top of, and, and we, we are in an active uh, release and development cycle. We're, we're an agile team, and so we will be revisiting the new release of those standards. Um, our product manager, uh, Nicholas Mathis, is, is very involved in the standards community, and so I, I can't give you a, a definitive timeline of, of when our checklist gets updated and, or, or what's in the, in the immediate um, kind of roadmap, but, but what I can say is that we are constantly updating, updating that list and those checks, and we are aware that WCAG 2.1 has been released, and so we'll be working on, on getting those you know, up to, to the newest standards. And, and just to be clear, too, um, we, we're checking against a number of those WCAG standards, and we, we're also checking against some, some, some of our own standards that we've developed, and so that, that ally checklist uh, includes a, a kind of custom amount of, of uh, content items that are uh, standardized things that we're checking against. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, and so here's, here's just a, a really good story of a, of a student who, you know, doesn't have the kind of disability that, that we typically associate with that term. Uh, but here's a student who is a mother who commutes to campus. She has a lot going on in, in her life. And for her, getting access to that audio format and being able to listen and review her content on, on the bus to school, uh, hugely important for her, um, and those alternative formats are, are giving her an opportunity to expand the study habits, again, when she, can, when she has the opportunity, when, when that need arises, and, and so we've seen some great stuff. Jess, I don't know if you want to chime in here about what you've seen as far as students and, and the alternative formats or, or how folks at, at your campuses have been uh, re responding to those. Um. As someone who doesn't work directly with students, <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, I know our colleges, though, have um, taken kind of different approaches in regards to marketing um, or kind of making sure students are aware that Ally is available um, because that's, that's been one challenge is that I would say faculty have seen it as a tool for themselves and for making their content accessible. And so kind of one of our next I think campaign items will be making sure that students are also aware of that ability to access alt formats without you know, seeking assistance from the DSS office or from their faculty member. Um, so we've been working on sample language and syllabus statements and whatnot um, just to help raise that awareness so that we see kind of greater interaction and engagement from students. Awesome, thank you. Um, and speaking of, of the instructors, and, and so Scott mentioned that, that, access, that accessibility solution with the instructor feedback, and Jess was just mentioning it here. And again, key to, to that integration, key to that use of those standards is being able to provide that feedback in the instructor's workflow. And so as they're building out their course, as they're adding new content items in there, or as they're reviewing a course to release for a next semester, they're going to see these little ally indicators next to all of the files that that ally is evaluating. And then what it's going to do is that we can click on that, that indicator, and it's going to open up this modal that's going to give the, the instructors that inline feedback for how to correct accessibility issues with that particular content item. 
And so when they open this modal, they're going to identify the severity of the accessibility issues that are facing that content item. In this case, it's a presentation that's missing alternative uh, description for the images. They're going to learn uh, uh, what those, those issues mean and why they matter. So really, Build, you know, using this as an opportunity to, to upskill and, and bring a knowledge and awareness to instructors about why these accessibility issues are important for all students. They're going to learn step by step how to fix those issues. In some cases, they can make the fix directly in the ally modal there. So if, if it's an image that's missing an alternative description, they can add that description right into the field there. Or in this case, where um, it's a PowerPoint presentation that has various accessibility issues, they can get the feedback, go offline to their, to their editor, to their PowerPoint software, make their corrections, and upload a new file. And when they do that, Ally is going to track the progress of how, how you're doing in, in terms of addressing those accessibility issues. And the goal, of course, is, is to get to 100%. Now, we say 100%. Uh, no content item is ever 100% accessible. There may be always situations where students have, have a very unique need or, or um, need, need uh, content in a particular kind of format. But 100% here is an approximation that, hey, there's no, there's no outstanding issues that, that we're noticing at this time. But again, it is always a process. Uh, inclusive design is, is a journey. It's, it's not an outcome. And so we're always mindful of, of how we contextualize these scores for instructors. And Jeff, I'll, I'll pass this back to you since this is from a study that you all conducted uh, with your instructors. Yeah, so after um, piloting Ally, and then we've also rolled it out mostly system-wide at this point, um, I wanted to get a read on how faculty were feeling about the tool and how they were using it. And one of our questions was about um, if Ally helped raise awareness around accessibility uh, for our faculty. And what we had was 74% um, responded that Ally did help raise awareness. And what I want to add to this um, is that I, if I remember correctly, I want to say almost the entire kind of remaining quarter um, who didn't, you know, immediately say yes, um, their, their answer was no, I was already very familiar with issues of accessibility. Um, so this wasn't a quarter of the people saying no, this didn't help me at all. Um, and I think that was just really powerful because faculty could go into their course and let's say, you know, look at their files list or their files manager and immediately see where the problem existed, um, which documents, which, which files, which images uh, were most problematic for their students. And I think that's really powerful because otherwise they'd have to go in, download the document, manually check it or, you know, rely on the, the checker in Microsoft Office um, in order to kind of track those problems. And so this was really great in terms of just, again, kind of helping shed light on what, what needs attention and how to prioritize um, kind of where that attention should go. Yeah, thanks, Jess. It's, it definitely, you can see why it's so important having that feedback in the workflow. I mean, we know from good learning that people learn best in real context. And so having a training in, in, a, in a workshop environment, that can be really good. Um, but, you know, we're all aware that when people leave that workshop, how much they forget, how much do they retain, um, how, how much support are they going to have when they're actually in the moment trying to tackle those issues. And so being able to build in this feedback right inside of the LMS, right where instructors are doing that heavy lifting for their course, hugely important to building that awareness. And, and for Ally, again, we're, we're providing a more accessible starting point and we're starting to build the awareness and the knowledge around accessibility to, 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 to make, you know, those intermediate steps towards building a more inclusive learning environment. So next we'll talk a little bit about data analytics and, and how we leverage data inside of Ally to help institutions strategize and track their progress. And Scott already mentioned uh, the barriers for institutions Again, looking into the LMS as, as just a black box with millions of content items sitting in there, it's really challenging to understand where the accessibility issues are, 
how to how to identify them and how to strategize to correct them. And so, so well, uh, John, yeah, mm -hmm. we, um, this is Sam. Sorry, we have a question that came in um, before we transition into the data um, part of this um, discussion. The question is um, related to different um, authoring tools that faculty may use before content gets in to the um, LMS. And so, you know, what about instructors who use these various authors, authoring tools before going into the LMS? Um, is Ally just looking at the content um, in terms of inside the LMS or um, if there are adjustments that are made in authoring tools outside and then re-uploaded? Um, are they re-analyzed um, for their um, improvement in accessibility? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. And, and of course, it would, in an ideal world, we would capture them inside of Word, inside of PowerPoint, right? But, you know, Microsoft has built some accessibility tools in there, and obviously we don't have any hooks into those, to those, those software to, to evaluate that content in the workflow of actually creating the content. So to answer the question briefly, no, we, 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 we're, we're not able to provide that feedback at the authoring level. And so where we come in is once that content is uploaded into the learning management system, that's where we're able to you know, run our checklist and our scan against it, identify the issues. And then what we do is, is that we, if it is like, okay, so you have a Microsoft Word document that you've uploaded into the learning management system, that Word document is lacking headers. So we'll, we'll flag that document. We'll tell you that it's, you know, it's missing headers. We'll explain why those headers are important. And then we'll link to, to the help uh, information or we build in some of the help information on how to use headings in Word to make the correction. So if you're completely unfamiliar with it, Ally is at least going to give you the starting point information for you to go back into that authoring tool to make the corrections. So we completely understand that in an ideal world, we would be capturing all of the accessibility issues before the stuff even got to the LMS. Um, and that's where, in, you know, if we imagine a, a completely interoperable world, you know, that kind of thing would happen. But we still have these, these um, silos, so to speak, that make, make that a challenge. And on the topic of silos, um, you know, we get, to, we get to data. And so, um, you know, data is, is, is hugely important to, to how we think about and strategize um, interventions in education. And IMS Global's Caliper Analytics has really been actively um, kind of bringing attention, bringing attention to um, vendors in the importance of having a standardized approach to their analytics. And the key there is that as opposed to having all these silos with pieces of data about students sitting in those, in those silos, we start to connect up all that information. And you know, if it's filtering into a learner record store or, or some kind of data warehouse, that's where we can do the kinds of rich analysis that are necessary for creating um, adaptive learning environments or more personalized learning environments. If we don't have a complete picture of student activity, it makes it really challenging to understand in depth what that learning process looks like. And so Caliper is an important standard for how we think about leveraging data to improve educational experiences. And so what Ally is doing is Ally is consuming Caliper events um, and using those to, to create that institutional report that Scott mentioned. And so, again, we are hooked into the LMS. We're looking at all the content that's sitting in that LMS. And the first thing we're going to provide you in the reporting is a, a temporal look at how your overall accessibility at your institution is changing over time. And you can look at that um, by, uh, you can filter it by term, by month, by year. Um, and you can see how you're doing without Ally. So that is, what is the content in your LMS? You know, what is the level of, of accessibility as it sits there? And then with that machine learning that Ally is doing in the background, uh, bumping up that score. So in this case, and, and, and we consider it a very modest estimation of how much Ally is improving the score in the background. We don't want to assume anything about automation and accessibility. And so these, that number is just a very low estimate of, of the kinds of um, 
machine learning improvements that are happening in the background. We're also going to track the total amount of content in there, a breakdown of the content types, which I think is a really cool way to think about UDL and representing learning content in different modalities and formats, being able to see the diversity of content that's in your LMS or looking at a course to see how diverse is the content that students are engaging in there. Really interesting way to think about uh, instructional design. Um, you can also, in our report, you can drill down by issues. So it's really nice that you can move from this 30,000 foot view of what the accessibility looks like across the whole LMS but then you're able to look across the severity of the issues. So we can, you know, if we want to strategize as an institution on how to tackle the most severe issues, we can filter those, pull those up. We can look at them file by file to really create a strategy around how to address those issues. We can also look at the course level. So for each course, again, what does the content look like in that course? What is the, the level of accessibility? And with a really, you know, this is looking kind of down the road, but with a really integrated kind of data warehouse, wow, you could have such incredible insights, you know, as you start to look at the relative accessibility of a course and the kind of content that lives in that course and how it relates to student learning outcomes or student engagement patterns, really rich insights and, and possibilities. And we have seen that data informed decision making in some of our uh, some of some of our ally users, some of our institutions. And so one institution, for example, used that report to identify one issue per month that would become the, the focus of an institutional campaign. So if it was adding alternative descriptions to images or if it was adding headings to Word documents. So really targeting, making it very tangible, very specific for instructors. Using a CSV or exports to, to do that detailed tracking. And what we saw with this one institution that implemented that strategy was a huge jump in their accessibility from largely inaccessible documents to documents that are very accessible and that are producing really high quality and useful kinds of alternative formats. Jeff, I don't know if you wanted to jump in here about the institutional report and how you used it a little bit uh, in your work. Um, yeah, so again, not being at a college, I actually don't have access to our college's institutional report, um, and I'm excited to get that data down the line, um, but it's been, you know, again, really interesting to see how different colleges have, um, have used that to inform kind of what they're doing, and I see there's a question as well in the chat about the connection between the use of ally and training efforts, um, and this was, and again, it really ties into the example you were talking about, John. Um, we had one e-learning director who noticed that their college's top issue, um, which was pulling down the score, was that lack of alt text. And so they did a great email campaign, um, and they just said, hey, you know, we have, I don't know, 700, 7,000. Um, I always get the decimal place by the number uh, off by one. Um, images without alt text and this is a really simple problem to solve and the email just walked through step by step how to go into canvas and add alt text to the images and um, what was really great from the data that i do have on our colleges is that from her efforts of doing just this really targeted campaign um, that school out of our 34 schools has the kind of second highest use of ally and so it really helped engage you know faculty around the campus and there there was even a little bit of kind of competition of departments um, you know racing to be the first department to fix all of their images um, and so that that's been really great and we've we also have some schools who kind of gamify it where faculty get a certain number of points for removing all of the red indicators from their from their course and you know based on other activities that they do um, with the instructional designers they can then you know win an ipad or and then one of the alexa things um, and so that's been kind of cool to see how colleges are trying to work on improving that score um, but i also think uh, you know seeing that institutional score can really help and, and seeing the breakdown of issues you know what is that top issue helps definitely inform people when it comes to training. And I know our faculty, when we did feedback, said that, you know, Ally is a really great tool, but 
but it has to be used with training. Um, it won't do the training for you. It's much easier to kind of understand the issues and how to solve them if you've received accessibility training um, in the past. And so we really, we really kind of push it as, you know, this is allies one part of um, that institutional strategy for improving accessibility, but it's not going to be, you know, the, the kind of easy button <laughs> for everything. Um, so it's, it's helped those e-learning directors really see what's going on. Um, and I think, you know, a number of them pointing out how many scanned PDFs are out there. Um, and, and again, kind of how do, we, how do we start shifting people away from reliance on the PDF? Uh, where faculty are a little less um, able to make those changes and edits if they don't have the right software. Thanks, Jess. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add to another advantage of, of having that LTI integration with the LMS is being able to recognize the different uh, levels of users in the system. And that allows us to actually control who sees these, alter these uh, ally indicators. So we wouldn't want, for example, students to be able to see the accessibility levels of the content. We want to keep that private for the instructor and for the institution. And so it's just important to mention that uh, when you're in a student role and you're going through the environment, you can see the drop down for the alternative formats. When you're an instructor or an admin, uh, you see the alternative format downloaded, but you also see the indicators. So those are private based on, on your, uh, your user level inside of the environment. And so, so just linking now, oh, yep, go for it. Uh, uh, I got a question. Um, so is Ally also available for web pages? Um, I'm, I'm assuming that the web pages inside the LMS are scanned, but I think this person is interested in web pages that may reside outside of the LMS that they might be linking to mm -hmm. or, um, you know, areas like that. Yes. So. Um, so you're right, so any HTML that's created using like a WYSIWYG inside of the LMS, so Canvas's, uh, you know, pages editor, what exists in Blackboard Learn, we will scan for the accessibility of, of that content, and we will, we will add that into the institutional report. We currently don't have instructor feedback uh, built into how to correct those issues in, in your HTML content authoring inside the LMS, but that's in our short-term roadmap. Um, the other piece of that then is that we also recently introduced Ally for the Web. And so this is a connected solution. It's purchased separately, but it is connected solution. And that will scan all of the web pages on your campus. Um, it's going to check those against WCAG 2.0 standard, AA standards, and it's going to feed that into an institutional report. So you can do across all of the, the websites sitting at your campus, you can use Ally for the Web. Uh, to do a scan on that. So we haven't talked too much about Ally for the Web in this particular presentation, but happy to follow up with more information on that if you're interested. And so now just looking at a vision for a personalized, inclusive learning environment. Uh, maybe, uh, Sam, maybe you want to talk a little bit about IMS's uh, accessibility standards here? Sure. Thank you very much. So um, I, I think, you know, one of the things that helps, I think, drive many of the um, things that have been talked about throughout the last 45 minutes or so um, are these standards that sort of sit in the background that play a very essential role in helping to get um, campuses to meet their objectives for accessibility. Um, IMS has a number of standards that um, <laughs> directed at accessibility. Um, two of them have been talked about in this presentation. Um, LTI and Caliper Analytics, um, but we also have the Access for All, which is an inclusive um, spec um, for inclusive design across the campus and the student experience um, to ensure that students have access um, to multiple areas and multiple things based on personal needs and preferences, um, which is also a standard and part of Access for All. Um, some of you may be familiar with question and text uh, interoperability. Um, which is the standard that helps to drive um, questions um, and tests um, being interoperable and accessible across multiple platforms. Um, IMS also has a role in EPUB um, with EPUB for Education. Um, that um, EPUB is um, actually handled by the W3C, 
um, but we do work closely with them, and um, EPUB for Education is that standard is within the purview of, of IMS. Um, several, a uh, couple of years ago, several IMS members um, got together, and we'll talk a little bit about this in just a few moments, um, and developed an article, there's a bit.ly URL at the bottom of this page called, and the, the document is called Enhancing Accessibility Through IMS Global Standards. Um, the graphic that you see on the screen um, is, is from that particular article that talks about how IMS standards um, can be used and aligned um, to support not only a accessible ecosystem, but also to help institutions reach their strategic goals um, for uh, campus-wide accessibility. So um, it is part of what we call our higher ed playbook, which is a series of resources developed by our institutional members for institutions. So I invite you to um, take a look at that article, particularly um, in terms of, and I think as um, John was talking about uh, at the early um, top of the presentation, we don't often think about um, technology and accessibility and standards when we have um, in the same way that we do our physical environment. So this um, document really helps to pull into focus um, things to think about um, across platforms, assistive technologies, interoperability. So I um, invite you to check that out. Um, thanks, John. Yeah, Thanks, Sam. And so, and and as Sam mentioned, there's there's just so many possibilities as these standards become more a part of of developer practices and really become a part of of our ed tech ecosystem. Um, and so, some things to be kind of cautious about, but also optimistic about. You know, one thing is right now we're seeing the the rise of of lots and lots of LTI apps. Um, but LTI apps don't, don't technically kind of talk to each other. And so one thing that we want to be careful about is that the LMS, in breaking open the black box, that we now don't fill it up with lots of little black boxes that don't speak to each other. And so one limitation of Ally is that Ally is going to scan all the file content that sits in your learning management system, but it's not going to be able to touch or look at content that may live inside of an LTI app that's then you know built inside of the LMS so that those third party tools and content that's living in, in in those third party tools it's not accessible to us right now and so that can leave lots of these kind of black holes or or missing spaces in a, a full accessibility initiative and so being conscious about that is really important um, there's also I think going to be some really interesting opportunities with the introduction of so many interesting and innovative tools for students to really have more control over how they configure their composing resources or their knowledge making resources inside of that experience so that they have more options and more choice in how they try to represent their understandings. Um, it gives opportunities for instructors to, to diversify their assessments. So really amazing opportunities there when we're talking about this innovative landscape of LTI applications. With Caliper, as I mentioned, and, and it's very similar to, to, to the LTI, vendor adoption is, is so key. So, you know, again, if we don't have consistent data across the entire student learning experience, we're going to have those gaps and those holes that are going to make it really difficult to, to make informed decisions and interventions. And then with Caliper as well, you know, it, it's, it's a fairly new standard, and, and so it's continuing to grow, and so we're continuing to think about the metric profiles or the vocabulary events that are specific to accessibility that can really help us um, leverage that standard and, and make it robust so that it has real impact on accessibility. That will be key moving forward. And what, what we can see coming out of that, and, and Sam talked about it in the Access for All and, and the preferences, is wow, we have this incredible moment um, on the horizon where students, you know, they could be offered a, a preferred format uh, for their content by default. So if we know that there's a student that uses an eBraille uh, reader in the course, that they would automatically get access to that eBraille version, that eBraille format, uh, without having to click through the other formats. It could load it up automatically for them. It could also adapt the experience as, as student need changes. And so the LMS recognizes that a student is, 
is on their, their mobile device. And so it's going to load up automatically a content item in the HTML format. So it's responsive to the phone. So you take a little bit of that of the burden of, of making some of those decisions off the user. Of course, allowing them to modify and change what, what was the recommended content format, um, but being able to prompt that in a way that really uh, makes it as seamless as possible, and as, as Jess mentioned, making sure students are aware of what's out there. Um, so, um, and then, questions, yeah. John, so questions come in, um, and I think this might be a good one for Jess to weigh in on. Um, the question, is there a learning curve for faculty to use Ally, and does it really require any free training? So this might be a, kind of a twofold question, but I'd be interested, you know, just from an institutional perspective, as you rolled out Ally in your um, pilot and then expanding it, expanded it to full adoption, um, what were your experiences in terms of a learning curve for faculty and what sort of training did you offer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that has, has been kind of funny, um, we're, we're a system that uses Canvas as our LMS, um, and if you're familiar with Canvas, they, they roll out updates um, every, every few weeks, and so I always joke that the quiz icon is always going to look different every few weeks. Um, and because Ally is so discreet in terms of kind of having a presence in the LMS, and there's actually Nowhere um, does it say ally. Uh, instead, you, you get the little indicators next to a file. Um, we, we had a number of faculty who thought it was just a Canvas update, um, that there was just something new with Canvas. And, and so it, when we started the feedback surveys, we realized we actually had to explain that this was a separate tool. You know, the company's name is Ally, um, in order, in part, for people to just understand um, you know, again, this was a tool integrated in uh, that, that is, yes, part of Canvas, but not Canvas. Um, and so, again, kind of raising awareness that way was important. Um, we also had a few faculty who weren't aware that they could click on that icon in order to get the instructor feedback. And so I think training is important. Um, at the same time for some schools where they decided to just do full rollout, you know, turn on, turn it on, and then we'll, we'll kind of deal with it. Um, because it is so discreet, it didn't cause, you know, a lot of uproar or resistance, um, which was really nice as well for, for institutions where maybe they didn't have as much support to be able to do a more dedicated rollout. Um, in our system accessibility training, however, we do address what Ally is and the different features and functions of Ally so that faculty do, you know, kind of come away understanding that this tool should be available for them. Again, it depends on the school that they're at and if they've enabled it campus-wide or not. Um, but I would say it's, it's relatively easy to use um, once you're aware <laughs> that it's there and that you can click on the indicators. And, and kind of get, get the tutorial on how to fix the problem. Um, it's fairly simple from that, from that approach, but just making sure people are aware of it because it is so discreet is, is really, I think, where, where the training had to focus. Thank you, Jess. Um, mm -hmm. So we have um, about six, seven more minutes um, left. Um, John, I know we have a couple of more slides to hit, but I also want to give some folks an opportunity to pose any questions. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and maybe roll through the next couple of slides. And um, I'd like to also open this up for questions, so if you do have any, please post them in the um, Q&A box, and um, we will um, get to them here in just a second. Go ahead. Yep, yep, thanks, Sam. Yeah, I can, I can move quickly through these, and, and so we were, uh, we've talked about this a little bit already. You probably got to see the slide. This idea of, of optimizing how we recommend content to, to students. So 
thinking about what is the sequence of engagement as they move through a unit, what kinds of formats or modalities of content are they engaging with, and trying to map that to, to different kind of learner preferences or to outcomes. And so again, they, we're not thinking about learning styles here. That, that's been a theory that's kind of been debunked in, in the research. But what we do know is that engaging this content in different modalities can really activate different kinds of, of processes in the brain. And so thinking about how do we recommend to students for optimizing their, their study practices can be really important. And so uh, in kind of closing up here, you know, really thinking about Ally as one tool in your inclusive learning strategy. And there's lots of other tools and initiatives and training that are a part of that. And building that all together as part of your strategy uh, is really key. And um, and adopting that consistent approach. And so we've talked about Ally for Web, actually. We've talked about Ally for Courses in the LMS. And then Blackboard does offer uh, training services, um, which Scott can chime in on in the Q&A uh, if we have time, um, but really supporting institutions design and develop and implement their, their accessibility strategy, we have found uh, really useful uh, for institutions. So we'll invite you to, to join us at the Ally user community. The website is there. You can follow product updates. Um, we're posting a number of case study stories right now that, that walk through how other institutions have been implementing Ally and, and what they've been seeing. And so the community is a really active place. If you're an Ally user, if you just want to join in on the conversation on accessibility, uh, you can do that. And I'll let Sam talk about IMS's community and, and how else you can get involved in the accessibility conversation. Yeah, I know the um, accessibility conversation landscape is, is a very rich one, and IMS Global um, has its Innovation Leadership Network, um, which is really focuses on um, accelerating the adoption of um, interoperability to support um, accessibility and inclusive design. Um, we do work directly with our institutional members. I know Jeff is very active in this particular group. Um, so thank you. Um, to develop resources, um, you know, by institutions, for institutions, that really get at um, helping institutions understand the importance and role of standards um, and how they fit into um, institutions reaching their accessibility goals. So, you know, this is one of those examples where there's not a single um, solution to this, but many people um, working simultaneously to get it. So. We did have one question um, in the Q&A that I'd like to kind of pull out um, to, the, to the panelists. Um, and I think this is a really good one, um, maybe close out our last couple minutes. Um, from your experiences, both at an institution as well as um, with um, Ally working with multiple groups, uh, multiple institutions, what have been the greatest challenges um, with Ally from a user perspective? This is Scott. I'll be glad to jump in with that one. Um, we have the opportunity to work with a, a number of institutions as they're getting ready to deploy Ally, as well as uh, once they have deployed that. And one of the biggest challenges that we hear institutions sharing back with us is that now that they have Ally or that they are wanting to deploy Ally, they realize that they really need a much larger strategy around this. Much like what Jess was sharing, that this is one of the tools in your toolbox, but now it really opens up the opportunity for that institution to really develop a strategy around accessibility and becoming inclusive. So oftentimes we come in and help the institution to be able to develop that strategy so that they can really be more successful in, in not only deploying Ally, but really meeting their goals and objectives. Great. Jeff, do you have anything you'd like to add? There we go. Um, I would just say the instances where, you know, a faculty might be using publisher content or, again, items that are in PDF format and they don't have the original, and so therefore they're aware that issues are present um, but are unable to make those fixes. Um, or don't know how to edit a PDF. Um, and so I think that that's been one big challenge. Um, even though Ally provides the alternative format, um, which could be a starting point for a faculty member to make the changes, it's still, it's still quite cumbersome, cumbersome um, with certain formats. 
Well, we are at the top of the hour, so I would really like to thank um, John, Jeff, and Scott for their time this afternoon and sharing their expertise. And I also would like to thank our attendees for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Kara indicated, um, we have recorded this, and we will be um, sharing that out. You'll be getting an email, a follow-up email on Monday. So if you have colleagues that weren't able to make the call or you would like to review any of the ideas um, or points that we have talked about, um, please um, feel free to share that. We wish you a wonderful weekend and happy Friday, and thank you again. Look forward to seeing you at a future um, IMF webinar.